Hello and welcome to Just One More Watch. Welcome today to a video I have been looking forward to making for years, literally years. Today I finally get to put a Seagull 1963 head to head with a Sea Gull 1963. Now, if you are rolling your eyes, you're probably already familiar with what's going on here. I made a video a few years back asking if the watch that we know as the Seagull 1963 is in fact a fake due to the presence of an official version made by C-Gull. My conclusion was the watch we know as the Seagull 1963 is exactly that. They're kind of a standalone item. Definitely not what I would describe as a fake, clearly made with the full knowledge of C-Gull, they supply the movements after all, but at the same time, not the genuine item due to the presence of an official version made by the official manufacturer. Today, at long last, I get to compare the two, to pour over the similarities and differences between them, and to ask the fundamental question, why does one cost $150, but the other cost $550? That's nearly four times the price. Can the official version possibly justify the price hike other than purely by virtue of the fact that it is official. Now you saw the pop-up. I bought the unofficial version of this watch many years ago. I bought several in fact over the years, but the official version was sent to me for review by the C-Gull official store on AliExpress. I will therefore leave a link in the description of the video to the listing of the official watch in the official store and the unofficial watch in the store where I bought mine from. I am itching to get into this. Let's flip the camera and get on with it. All right, let's get into it. I'm gonna show you various pieces of macro footage of the two watches with either the letter A or the letter B in the top corner denoting which of the two watches you're looking at at any given time. I guess there are two questions therefore that you and I have to answer based on this footage. The first is, are there actually any discernible and appreciable differences between the two watches? And if the answer to the first question is yes, then the second question is, are there $400 worth of differences between these two watches? Let me just say I'm a big fan of the Seagull 1963, but you, you probably knew that already. I had one in my collection long before I started this channel. I think I bought three now in total. I think it's one of these watches that everybody perhaps not loves and desires to own necessarily, but at least gives some nod of respect to. It's an original Chinese design after all, and we all know that there still aren't too many of those, and there's nothing else that quite looks like it. I mean, gold applied numerals, blue hands and red accents, a rather unorthodox combination, and one that I have never seen elsewhere, frankly, and yet on this little watch, they just work together. It is such a charmer. And not only does the watch have a nice backstory, being based on one of a number of prototypes that were developed for the Chinese People's Liberation Army Air Division back in the early 60s, the movement that powers it also has a nice backstory. The Seagull ST19 being essentially an old Swiss Venus column wheel chronograph movement, the Caliber 175 specifically, that debuted sometime in the 1940s. So the movement in these watches essentially is 80 years old, a bit of a living fossil then in the watch world. But enough of that, how are you getting on with the footage? You've now seen plenty of comparative shots of watch A and watch B, what are your conclusions so far? Have you noticed any differences between them? Well, there are clearly a couple of differences that should be obvious. Watch A has a second line of text. Now, I don't speak Chinese, so there's no clue in there for me. You probably also noticed differences in the bezel and crystal arrangement of each watch. Watch A has a fairly large piece of heavily domed crystal, whereas watch B has a larger fixed high polished bezel and a smaller piece, therefore, of less domed crystal. And if we look at the two cases in profile, you'll be able to see what I mean about the crystals even more, I think. You'll also be able to see that to all intents and purposes, and to my eyes at least, the cases are identical. There's no difference in finish between them, there's no difference in size or shape between them either. One thing I did spot is that Watch A has an unsigned crown and Watch B has a star logo on the crown. You probably spotted that as well. So then, what is the official watch from the official store and what is, in inverted commas, the imitation? At least that's what they call it in the official store. The official line is that anything that isn't official is an imitation. Well, you probably guessed it, Watch A is the official watch, the one with two lines of text and the larger piece of more heavily domed crystal. Watch B is the 
unofficial watch, the imitation watch. Now, the reason for the difference between the crystals is that watch B is my unofficial 1963. I ordered specifically with sapphire crystal. It therefore comes with a piece of less domed sapphire and a bezel to fill the gaps. The official version features acrylic crystal per the original prototypes back in the 60s, hence the extreme doming. I have, however, previously owned the acrylic crystal unofficial version, and those are readily available again for around $150. If that was the version of the imitation watch that I was comparing to the official one today, there would therefore be one less way of differentiating between them. Apart from that though, they're pretty much the same. I think the numerals are slightly thinner on the official version, but not by much. The dial, the hands, the cases, and the chrono pushers appear the same. There's a slight color difference between these two watches. I'm not sure how much of that is is due to a difference in dials and how much is due to a difference in the crystals. I wouldn't say that one was nicer than the other in terms of color, just slightly different. There is, however, one major difference that I have not shown you yet. The unofficial watch features a display case back, so you can see that column wheel chronograph movement in action. It's a fun little thing to look at as well, provided you don't look too closely, that is. I did say this was a Chinese-made movement and an 80-year-old movement at that. The official version has a closed case back. In some ways, it's a shame because you don't get to see the movement, but I guess there were no display case backs on the original, so this is therefore more authentic. And it features that all important QR code. Seagull are at great pains to tell you without the QR code, it's not an official product. So what happens when you scan the QR code? Uh, sadly, nothing. Packaging between the two watches is pretty similar. The unofficial versions come in a variety of different packaging. I bought them before and they've come in a tin. This one, interestingly enough, has some Sujess branding on it. As far as I was aware, the unofficial ones are manufactured by a company called Red Star. Regardless, you get two straps with the unofficial one, a drab green double pass NATO, and a two-piece black leather with quick release. Neither of them are particularly good though, to be honest. The NATO is really rather heinous. It is incredibly stiff, I mean comedically stiff. So I'd recommend dumping the stock straps and putting them on pretty much anything you have in the house instead. I normally wear my 63 on either of these two, a really soft leather NATO or a handmade two-piece. It's actually 19 mil, but I've squeezed it to fit these 18 mil lugs now. The official packaging isn't all that different to be honest, and it also contains two straps, oddly enough the same two straps as the unofficial a double pass green NATO and a two piece black leather, both of which have the Seagull brand name on the hardware. The NATO is much softer and therefore much more usable than the unofficial one, but it still doesn't mean to say that either of these straps are particularly good. Again, I would recommend keeping the color tones, but fitting something of your own instead. So where does that all leave us then? Have we answered those two questions? Are there any discernible and appreciable differences between the watches? And if so, can we find $400 worth of difference between the watches? To be honest, this has all gone pretty much as I expected it would today. Given that the two watches are essentially the same in terms of dial, hands, case, movement, and even crystal, if you don't go for the Sapphire version, how could the official watch possibly justify costing so much more other than by virtue of the fact that it's official? Sure, a limited edition and limited case number on the back is something, and the two supply straps are undoubtedly better than the two supply straps of the unofficial watch, but that doesn't mean to say that either of them are particularly good as discussed. The question then becomes, how much more are you prepared to pay for something that is material identical to something else, but that comes with the added benefit of being officially certified? I definitely think there is some value to be had in owning the original, but I definitely don't think it's a 3X or a 4X. Seagull seem determined to keep pushing the prices up on these official 63s. I mean, 550 US dollars is the current sale price. I think the non-sale price is 679 US dollars. That means the regular price is well over a thousand Australian dollars. I think I've seen them even higher than that in the official store as well. I took a screen grab from that original video that I made nearly three years ago, which clearly shows the price back then, 399 US dollars. So since then, they have nearly doubled the price of these. Clearly, they have reasoned that they make a limited edition, limited supply, official version of the 63. And if my case back number is true, then there are only about 500 of them left to sell. They may as well sell all remaining stock for as high a price as possible, with their profit coming from margin rather than volume. 
because of course, Seagull are still making profit based on volume. They make money every time Red Star or Sujez or whoever manufactures the unofficial product sells one because of course it contains a movement manufactured by Seagull. I think that a couple of years ago when these were 399, I would have said there was an argument to be made for buying the official one, or at least a much stronger argument than can be made today. Sure, it was still 250 more, or over twice the cost of the unofficial version, but like I said, there is value, especially if you're a fan of the watch, in having the most official, if not necessarily the most authentic, version of the 63. But at 550, you would have to be a massive fan of the 63 and have fairly deep pockets in order to take the decision to buy the official version rather than the unofficial version. So there you have it. Much as I have suspected for a number of years now, the official version struggles to justify its price when compared to the unofficial but surely tacitly endorsed version nonetheless. I guess if you are a big fan of the brand like I am, I guess if you are a big fan of the watch like I am, it is possible to justify the more expensive watch. It's got nicer straps and it is a little bit different, etc. And it's official, but it hasn't always been this expensive. It was $400 a few years ago. At $400, there's a stronger argument for it than at $550. Put it that way. If you are into the 1963, which you clearly are, check out that video where I dig into the backstory. I had a, a lot of fun making it and have a look at my review of the larger 40 mil version. Thanks for watching. Thanks for coping with the hyphens. I'll see you all again in a future video.